Are you curious to see a 1964 home be transformed into a luxury home that feels brand new? I'm Holly McCann, a realtor, and I'm gonna share my secrets with you of how I did it in this home. Let's go take a look. And be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of my great new videos. The first and biggest thing that we did to this house that was a major transformation is we enclosed what was once a courtyard, this little area, you can see where it used to be, and so we made it part of the living area and living space. We also stole part of it for the new primary master bathroom. It's awesome. So in enclosing the courtyard, what we had to do was obviously drywall it in, pour a concrete foundation, and of course we did all this with permits because you wanna make sure you get credit for the square footage added on record, on record with the county assessor. So in order to get credit for square footage added, make sure you permit it and do it right. We also put skylights in. We love skylights, especially it would feel so much darker in here without them. So if you're enclosing a space in, you got to think about what you can do to still bring the natural light in. Maybe more windows, maybe more skylights. So in this case, the skylights really helped still bring the light in. The kitchen underwent major changes. As you can see, we've added a big island, which is what is on trend with what today's homeowners and home buyers want. I always love to include a bar with seating. You can fit three, maybe four people at this bar so they can see what's going on in the kitchen. It's perfect for parents who want to have their kids do homework that need help while they're cooking or maybe making lunches in the morning. It's just really a nice feature to have. So in here, we also raised the ceiling. We pushed the ceiling up. We had to add insulation. We put in a skylight. We put in can recessed lighting. That's really important too. You, lighting is everything in today's environment and what today's homeowners want. In the old days, there wouldn't be very much overhead lighting. There might be one chandelier in the middle of a dining area and then for the secondary rooms, all there would be is wall plugs to have floor lamps. But now everybody wants lots of recessed lighting. They want lights everywhere. They don't want to rely on the floor lamp. So we did that. You can see the beam that we put in. Um, we had to do that to support the home structurally. Raise the ceiling. High ceilings are always desirable and what people want. It costs money and takes time, but in our opinion, it's worth it. And my husband who's six foot four always wants every ceiling taller because he's a tall guy and likes to have that height. So um, as far as what we did in the kitchen, we didn't change too much as far as where the main, the main things were located. In fact, you can see that the stove is in about the same location as it was before. So that's what we've done with the kitchen. We'll move on to some other areas next. So in our dining area, I do have one chandelier. I feel like I had to have that but I really um, restrain myself from putting very many decorative or hanging lights because I have found as a realtor shopping with home buyers, I'll, like one time I saw these beautiful big um, pendants, two of them hanging over an island in a pretty new construction house. Maybe it was only three or four years old. And the shopper, the home shopper I was with said, oh, I do not like those pendants. That is not my style. And it was a deterrent, but it didn't stop her from buying the home. So I remember that as I am, when I'm flipping a house, I want to make sure that I don't put too much distinct design. I will not be putting navy blue cabinets or green cabinets that some people will do, and it's fine, but when I'm trying to appeal to the masses, when I'm renovating a home to sell, we go with white. We want neutral. We want as little um, distinct design as possible in it. So. I do have one chandelier that would be very easy for someone to change if it's not their favorite. You know, we just did the dark um, black, I guess it's not quite black, but it's really close to black uh, metal. And then we also added, you know, when I'm going back to floor plan, I told my husband, we have to add more storage. We have to have a pantry in this kitchen because there wasn't really one in here. And people always will ask me, where's the pantry? Where do I put my food? So in this case, we added this pantry that's technically kind of in the dining area, but it's gonna add so much storage for the new homeowner. 
So some of the important elements in my kitchen planning and design are a trash drawer. I think it's really important to have a trash drawer near the sink. So usually trash on one side, dishwasher on the other. Could be flip-flopped, you know, depending on what you're doing there. And then also I love, if you're in the right price point, to do a drawer microwave. I love these. The, the panel just flips open and the whole microwave is hidden under the counter. They're not cheap. This thing is like $1,300. It's a lot of money compared to what they call an OTR, over the range micro. But if I put a microwave over here, over the range, I just think it wouldn't look nearly as nice as having the microwave hidden. This way you can do more decorative hoods. Also, I always recommend, if the budget allows, a counter depth fridge so it's more shallow. You're not um, having a fridge protrude into the kitchen. Like it just feels better to have that pushed back, microwave under the counter, you have a trash drawer, all those things are creating kind of like a clean, simple look for your kitchen instead of having a trash can out and a microwave on the counter and a fridge sticking out. So just think about those design elements to make more of a modern, simplistic, clean design. One more feature that I just can't left um, be untalked about is the big drawers. The big drip drawers are really in style and in demand. See how it comes all the way out to um, cheaper cabinetry might only come out that far. So it comes out all the way big and deep and it has a soft close, which everyone loves. So to have two big drawers versus a stack of drawers or the cabinets that open, this is what's in style and this is what people want. This is one of the things I always do in these older 1960s and 70s homes if the opportunity makes sense. All of these bedrooms, there's three bedrooms along the back of the house, used to have windows that ended about right here, which is great if you're putting a bed under the window, but I love to put a full length sliding glass door that lets lots of light and lots of fresh air in. It just makes such a big difference in all these secondary bedrooms, so all three of my secondary bedrooms have new sliding glass doors in them. When it comes to lighting in these secondary bedrooms, as I mentioned earlier, in the old days, all these houses, all they had was one wall plug that would be connected to a switch at the door. So the only source of light would be flip on a switch and you'd have a floor lamp or a table lamp to illuminate the entire room. That's just not very great, not very desirable. So we put in usually four can lights in each secondary bedroom and in the master bedroom. And my favorite thing to do is just to put the pre-wiring for a ceiling fan or chandelier right in the center so it's all set to go. If someone wants a ceiling fan, it's super easy and convenient for them to put it in. But plenty of people don't like ceiling fans and they don't like the look of them. They think, oh, they look too clunky. So since we also have brand new air conditioning in this house, people may not even care to have ceiling fans. They can just keep it like this. The new primary bathroom has been severely changed. It used to be really tiny, and now we've expanded it into what was the courtyard. And of course, the opportunity presented itself. We wanted to put in a big skylight to bring in the natural light. You can see also we did something called large format tiles. Look how big each tile is. They're huge. People like less grout lines, less grout. They like a look of like uniformity, continuity. We're not doing like the, the strips of accent colors. You know, 10 years ago, there'd be a strip of like turquoise or green or blue or something. Now it's all one color. And in this case, we also did what is called a zero entry shower. You don't have a little dam wall that you have to step over. You just walk right into it. And because of that, um, we also have just one pane of glass, the fixed pane of glass for the shower. Rather than enclosing the whole thing and having doors, less is more. So we just wanna have as little as possible as far as things protruding, protruding and sticking out. We did a free standing, free standing tub which is what's most popular today with the black faucet and hardware. Um, black is very in style now. Sometimes people do black or gold. We go for black. It seems a little more appealing to the masses. We have the same cabinetry that we did in the kitchen here. This space was too big to do 
um, just one freestanding vanity. We probably could have done two, but we really like the look of the continuous cabinets with the custom fabricated quartz countertops. And if you've seen all my other videos, you know my secret for the mirrors. I love to get decorative mirrors for my bathrooms at Home Goods or TJ Maxx. These were actually on the more expensive side. They were about a hundred bucks. In the past, I've gotten smaller ones that might be a little more plain for about 50 to $60 each, but these were a hundred each. But to me, it's well worth it because that's one of the primary accessories and colors in the bathroom too. And I try to do just clear glass for my lighting as opposed to anything too ornate so that hopefully it will once again be the most neutral and appeal to the most people possible. Now, right over here, we have a separate toilet room. These are really nice too. You see these in the higher end homes, but the toilet is in its own separate enclosed room. Gives maximum privacy and it hides the toilet, which is not always the prettiest designer feature in a bathroom. So here in the living room, we had a dilemma when we were doing this house. There used to be a fireplace right here and it had some kind of cool looking mid-century modern stone on it. My husband really wanted to keep it. He says, oh, it looks so cool. Well, it does, but we didn't leave the rest of the house with the mid-century modern vibe anymore. There's a couple of little elements, like that big picture window over there that still, you know, echo back to the mid-century design. But what we did here is first we took off the stone off the fireplace and we were gonna retile it. And then he's like, do you just wanna get rid of it? Cause it was so awkward being right here in the corner. You couldn't really furnish around it. You weren't gonna have like a couch facing it. So in the end, we decided to completely eliminate the fireplace and chimney. And I think I'm glad we did. Curious to know what your thoughts are on it though. Leave a comment below about that if you'd like. People often ask me, do you have a designer? How do you know what to do in a house? Who does all the design of all your flips? Well, it's actually pretty simple. We always paint the walls white. We always do luxury vinyl plank flooring, unless it's over 2 million, and then we'll do real wood. And we go with a tan color, or whatever you wanna call this color. And we do black hardware, the white shaker cabinetry, the white quartz with a slight gray veining, extremely neutral. We don't have to decide over and over again. The thing that kind of takes us the longest is just deciding what shower tile. We've been going to larger and larger format tiles, but it's still, it's gonna be white every time. That's what sells. So there you have it. There are some insights um, behind the scenes of what we do when we're flipping a house. And I wanted to say the final thing, the most important thing at the end is if you are renovating a home to sell or just improving your own home to sell, the staging. The staging is key. The staging is hugely important. The staging in this house is the nicest we've ever done. And I'm really excited about it. It's definitely a step up from home goods and those kind of big box stores. And it shows that home has been elevated to a whole new level, hoping we're gonna get a higher price because of it. But when you have high-end staging, it's gonna help your home sell faster and for much more money than if you leave it vacant or with some old, not so great furniture in it. I guarantee it. I hope you enjoyed this tour of my Dana Point listing. Comment below the things you liked and maybe didn't like and any tips that you have too. Be sure to subscribe for more great real estate videos.